got a loan book of about 100 billion. We write about 30 billion worth of loans a year and, and growing. We've been really obsessive over building a great digital mortgage experience, but mm. at the end of the day, the mortgage is just how you fund the transaction. Mm. So overnight, we went from being sort of less than 1% market share to just coming up on 5% market share. $100 billion loan book. What's the scale? How many team members do we have today? We've got about a thousand team members. Okay. Big business. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest killer of businesses is slow decision making. And often the absence of a decision is actually worse than the wrong decision. One of the key parts of my role is to make sure we've got the right people in the organisation. Mm. Like we'd rather have an empty seat than yeah. get someone that, you know, is going to kind of, yeah, that they'll, they'll do. When you set out to go after like a big lofty goal, that big lofty goal, it starts in one person's head or two people's head or three people's head. I think the thing that's I'm most proud of is when I see that vision in our people and success for me is seeing someone in the team selling our vision to someone else because that says that you've got people not just on the journey as passengers. But Your want for like going deep on like the AI topic. And like it's five years from today, like how do you think that this is gonna change the world? Oh, such a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Chew the Fat. I'm absolutely obsessed with high performance and business. So I sit down with incredible guests and we talk about what it takes to be at the top. This is part of my mission to raise a million dollars for children's cancer by running a cookbook called Eat With Purpose. I've got one ask for you. Share the content. The bigger the audience, the bigger the impact. Let's get stuck in. David, as part of uh, every guest that joins me on Chew The Fat, I ask, what dish do you want out of the cookbook? Today you chose this snapper with uh, capers. There was no snapper available. So strike <laughs> one against like Barra. <laughs> yeah, strike one against me and the cookbook. Barra money available. Yeah. Um, mate, let's get stuck in. Sounds great. Let's do it. I want you to think about the most vivid memory you have when it comes to a meal. You take a moment. It's got to be, um, there's this great little restaurant. I'm just trying to remember the name of it. Mm. It's on Mallorca yes. in Spain. Love. And it's a Michelin star restaurant, but it's like, it's pretty cash. Like yeah. people are still there in board shorts and stuff. Mm -mm. And they do this dinner setting and the sun's coming down. It's, it's a tasting menu only. Mm -mm. It's just like absolutely fantastic. Love that. How it's a great that? spot. <laughs> that was my yeah. first test of that question and went well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate, we'll, we'll finish up this little dish and then we'll get stuck into the interview. David Hyman, co-founder and CEO of Lendy. Welcome to Chew the Fat. Thanks, Frank. Great to be here. Mate, where I'd love to start is like, what are a couple of key moments in your childhood that made the person you are today? It's a really good question. Um, so probably the first one that comes to mind is, and it's probably a little bit cliche to talk about business, but mm. I was always super interested in how people make money. Mm. Um, and as I don't quite remember exactly how old I was, but sort of I remember the house I was living in. So I was, <laughs> I was some, somewhere older than 10 and somewhere younger than 15 or 16. Yeah. Um, just w was really curious about how, like, how to make some cash and – this was before I could get a job and all that sort of stuff. And so decided to um, try my hand at drop shipping computer parts. Nice. <laughs> and was basically um, managed to put together a little business that was effectively had a supplier. Um, I was selling on these online forums and um, really got to know a lot about, you know, cost of goods, how you'd market yourself <laughs> and where that all goes. Mm. And that was really just for me. I think the takeout was... Um, just really understanding the basics of business. Like mm. you, sort of, you sort of have to learn for yourself a crash course in like everything from go to woe, um, getting an ABN <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and everything all the way through to, you know, custom support and everything mm. on, in between. And, and, and apart from that moment, like yeah. um, talk to me, like how, how were you raised? Like what were the values in your home? Yeah, so both of my parents, um, small business owners, mm. um, incredibly hardworking and – they weren't necessarily overt about the values. They just mm. sort of demonstrated them every day. Perfect, so like yeah. do what you say you're going to do. Um, family is really, really important. So we had like lots – well, I've got four brothers. Mm. Um, so we spent a lot of time together. <laughs> Where are you in the hierarchy in terms of age? I'm the second oldest. Nice. Um, yeah. But there's like a big gap between – my youngest yeah. brother's 22, my oldest brother's 45. Yeah, right. So there's a big gap between us. Yeah. Um, but all super close. A um, couple of the brothers work in the business today. Nice. Uh, which is awesome because uh, we get to see each other a lot. But 
yeah, from a family perspective, that was pretty important. Um, and then just, um, you know, surround yourself with people that you want to be around. Like, mm. obviously, you can't choose your family, but you choose your friends. Mm. And um, just growing up, that was something that my parents kind of did quite extensively. It was just, you know, surround themselves with people that they wanted to hang around. Awesome. And, and for, the, for those that don't know, like, it, it, paint me the picture, like, what is Lendy today? Yeah. And, of course, we're going to dig into a couple of things and get a bit more context, but just mm. frame up what's Lendy today? So Lendy today is the leading retail and digital broking business in Australia. Mm. Um, so we've got two major brands, Lendy and Aussie. Lendy is really pure play digital. Um, most of the audience would know Aussie, the original disruptor in mortgages back in 1992. Um, we have about 1,300 brokers mm. in the group across three different channels. So we've got a digital channel, we've got a mobile channel and a retail channel, which is um, in the Aussie brand. And we've basically spent the last decade building out what we think is the best digital experience, but it's omni-channel. So mm. customers can start online, finish in store. Mm. They can do the whole thing end-to-end -end online if they want to. Um, and as a result of all of that, um, we've got a loan book of about $100 billion. <laughs> We write about $30 billion worth of loans a year and, and growing. Um, and really like the next phase for us is, is all about connecting the 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 mortgage transaction mm. with the property search and ownership experience. It, it help me understand what, is it, what does that mean? So um, we've been really obsessive over building a great digital mortgage experience, mm. but mm. at the end of the day, the mortgage is just how you fund the transaction. Mm. Mm. And the transaction is people's home ownership goals. They're either first home buyers getting to their first house, they're investors building wealth through property um, or an owner occupier moving from one place to the next. Mm. And... Um, there's a real big disconnect between the finance transaction and actually the property search piece mm. and also what happens once you bought the house, you know, how you track its value mm. and how do you, you know, ultimately unlock the most possibilities you can out of the home. Um, and so we're sort of starting to build out both digital experiences but also service-based experiences on top to bridge the gap between those two. Awesome. And and one of the things I'm fascinated and I was thinking a lot before you came here today <clears throat> and it's something that's been on my mind because I listened recently to a Mark Zuckerberg interview and this moment like this penny dropped for me where I went this person was the founder when you're in the garage mm. and you're now the CEO and the right CEO at the helm of a trillion dollar company and like as, as an individual like the, the growth that's required to do those because it's fundamentally t totally different roles mm. and then i thought about yourself like the the what you've just talked about there a hundred billion dollar loan book what's the scale how many team members do we have today in lindy we've got about a thousand team members 300 <laughs> brokers <Okay>. big business <laughs> <laughs> big business right yeah. so okay perfect what firstly like what has how have you been able to like grow yourself um, to be able to get to where you are today and and also like what fundamentally has changed from like your required skill set from, mm. from back then to now? Yeah, so I think um, as you go through that journey, there are many, there are many sort of milestones mm. and phases but probably the biggest one was when we brought the Aussie business into the group. Mm. Um, so overnight we went from being sort of less than 1% market share to – just coming up on 5% market share and from hundreds of employees to thousands in the group mm. and the complexity of, you know, franchise model and, and all that sort of stuff. And I think at the beginning of all of that, um, you've got to, you've got to constantly be asking yourself the question, like, are you the right person for the role? Yeah. You've got to want it and you've got to have a view that you've got the skill for it. Um, and, you know, thanks. Like I, I've continued to ask myself that question. Mm. I challenge my board to continue asking that question um, and it's something that I've been really and, – and Bass, who's co-founder, him and I still run the business like a founder-led organisation. And that's probably like – that's probably the key to answering your question, which is actually um, you go through these journeys and there are lots of people on the outside saying, here's what you should do. Mm. Um, you should hire this person from this organisation because they've kind of got this level of experience. And sometimes those things are right. Um, there's actually a um, – uh, and I, I don't remember who was talking about it, but this thing a few weeks ago that blew up on on X mm. um, called Founder Mode. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you saw that. <laughs> I saw it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it really resonated with me because um, we've been on this like constant journey to work out in a founder-led organisation, on one hand, how do you make sure you're 
you know, the leader that mm. needs to be there for the organisation. But at the same time, how do you make sure that the things that got you to where you are and got the organisation to mm. where you are, you're in the detail on? Mm. Um, and having team members and leaders in the business that, that can appreciate that as well. And also, um, so it's everything from like skip level meetings and mm-hmm. getting involved deeply in product and mm. caring deeply about the product you're building and how you're going. Um, but then in terms of skills, um, it doesn't just happen organically. You've mm. sort of got to go and seek that stuff out. So again, when we when we did the Aussie transaction, um, none of us had ever done a merger. Mm. <laughs> um, so thankfully we had like six months between signing the deal and um, completion. Mm. Uh, we spent six months kind of, you know, looking at, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked, mm. what are the different approaches you can take, frameworks. There's so much information out there mm. um, and we're just – you know, curious learners um, and you just got to always have that learning mindset. Yeah. And, and where do you go for that learning? You know, I think people hearing is like, oh, yeah, but, you know, that's a big billion-dollar business. Like it's a, it's like – but like where does David go to get that kind of information about like a, a merger? Yeah, so I've tried as much as possible to surround – we've been sort of pretty fortunate, fortunate to have a whole bunch of very experienced mm. – both investors and I'd sort of say loosely advisors that have been um, surrounding the business Mm. for a long time. Um, That's been incredibly helpful and I call on them for different topics Mm. Um, and we're really lucky that they sort of give us their time and, you know, care about the outcome. And there's many, you know, everyone from sort of people that have started and sold businesses to – you know, people in the in the PE world, mm. the investment banking world, the you know even more traditional roles mm. um, across finance and real estate. Um, and then I'm just I'm a, I, I'm a relentless reader. I probably spend um, I spend hours every day across both fiction and nonfiction. Really, um, the fiction is to put me to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I spend a lot of time on X, and that's just mm. a bit of a rabbit hole. Obviously, used to be <laughs> used to be Twitter, yeah. but in a good way. Like if you know that it's a bit of an echo chamber. Mm. You can create your own environment around content and know who you're following and yeah. um, that leads you to sort of blogs and other platforms that you can use to sort of, you know, whatever the topic is, whether it's um, mergers or AI mm-hmm. or... I found it's a tre- treasure trove. <laughs> That's interesting. It's it's you know there's so much uh, there's so many opinions out there about social media and uh, how it's bad, but like the reality is you know it's a tool mm. and you can shape that tool uh, if you go there to do the right things, not watching um cat videos or or you know very popular on some Instagrams, <laughs> people dying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's a good way to shape a conversation as well. So <clears throat> we, uh, if I find something that's interesting, I'll throw it to the team and mm, say, mm. hey, read this. And you know what are your thoughts on A, B, and C? And it's a good way just to drive dialogue, mm. even if even if the original thing was wrong. Yeah, um, it might be a contrarian way to sort of drive a particular discussion. Now, the merger between um, um, Aussie and Lendy is really interesting, right? It's a, the uh, the style of merger for, from from an outsider's perspective is you've got uh, like an an older school business that was the um, let's call it the incumbent, the largest player, and you've got the new you know tech. Um, very savvy uh, organization built in a different way mm. but fundamentally those are, are totally different types of organizations in the way they're run and the you know how did you go from the transition from a very tech focused business to that new world and trying to bring them together yeah it was one of the biggest challenges um as part of the merger like mm. everything if you sort of think about when you're planning a merger mm. you've got the what we called the industrial logic so you know does one plus one equal five mm. then you've got the financial model the business plan and everything around that. The hardest bit is the cultural bit. Mm. Um, and Aussie was the leading retail player when we when we took over the business for a reason. Mm. It, it was incredibly successful. Um, John, who started the business, and James, who ran it after him, um, had built an excellent business, mm. very, very deeply loyal um, brokers, excellent distribution network, very trusted brand. And what we needed to do was we needed to sort of say um, – Lendy's been really successful and taken a lot of market share very, very quickly. Mm. We needed to very, very quickly understand what was it that made Aussie successful, what was it that made Lendy successful and how do we try and find the best blend of those two things across both people, culture, ways of working, Mm. organisational structure, like all the things that sort of fit within that. And at the same time it was a really good opportunity for us to leave a bunch of baggage at the door. Mm. Like what – in Lendy's, in Lendy's case, like we didn't bootstrap the business but when you're growing a business so quickly there's an, almost like the business version of tech debt that exists. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like how do you leave some of that stuff behind? And yeah. the same thing with Aussie. There was, you know, so many things that people said, oh, we've just done it like that for, for 10 or 20 years and it's just the way it is. So mm. 
gave us an opportunity to kind of, you know, bring the broom into a lot of that stuff. And then we went through a number of phases but sort of had like almost a day one, month 12, mm. month 24 kind of milestone points where we sort of said here's what makes Aussie great, here's what makes Lendy great, bring those together as Lendy Group which mm. is the, the name of the group um, and we're just constantly iterating. Mm. Um, and so probably the, the most recent um, – example of all of that is um we did a big reset about 18 months ago um once we'd run enough like we'd run the business for long enough and we had enough of the core crew set to um be able to say with a high level of conviction okay this is the pathway forward and we did a big reset around two things our ways of workings and our principles so mm. i think you know every organization has like the vision the mission the values and we have all of those things uh, but we spent a you know a good deal of time I actually took my whole group leadership team off-site for a week and we spent the week on ways of working and principles. And this was actually about on the principles side was um, – I don't know if you – have you read um, Ray Dalio's book, Principles? principles? Yeah, yeah. So inspired by the concept, yeah. not necessarily the – The execution the, or, the, or the, the exact principles. The exact yeah, principles. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we came up with our own version. Mm. And the whole thing here was – as a leadership team, we need to all be aligned and we, mm. need to be, we need to be consistent around how we're making decisions, how we're treating people, how we're thinking about growth. Um, and we came out of that week with 10 principles that we'd all sort of signed up to covering everything from like we have a radical transparency principle. It's mm. not as extreme as Ray Dalio. <laughs> yeah. We don't have recordings in our meeting <laughs> yeah, rooms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, that, that's about saying like mm. you've got to like keep things out in the open. Yeah. Let's not have silos. Let's not have politics, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Um, all the way through to another one which I love, which is create, celebrate, iterate, which is just about shipping stuff. Yes. Not trying to make it perfect, being mm. really clear on what are one-way doors and what are reversible decisions mm. and encouraging the f- like forward forward motion within the organization and celebrating along the way. Like yes. we got something out, great. That's, you know, high five. That's a milestone. Great. Move on to the next one. But oftentimes you can kind of get stuck in the rut of mm. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, getting stuff done and moving on to the next one without sort of, you know, making sure people have the right praise along the way. I think that's like the high performance and entrepreneur's dilemma sometimes, right? It's like mm. you, you're always shooting for here and and often we don't st- st- like take a moment and reflect and, and celebrate and that's mm. so critical for the team because if you're like constantly like next, 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 like fuck, are we, just, are we, are we excited about this <laughs> cool thing we did over there? You're like, don't worry about that, bro. Yeah, it's done. That was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you, know, you touched on something there for, for the listeners they may not have heard about it, this idea around one-way doors and reversible doors. Yeah. Give us a little bit more insight into like what that looks like for you um, and what does it mean? Yeah, I, look, I think at, at, a, at a high level um, – I think the biggest killer of businesses is slow decision making. Um, you see so many times, if you think about like when people talk about, oh, that business is slow at doing X, what they're really talking about is they're not making decisions fast enough. Mm-hmm. They're either people are either outsourcing their decision making to consultants um, or they're not taking accountability and they're letting someone else make the decision or they're just not doing anything at all. Mm-hmm. And, and often the absence of a decision is actually worse than the wrong decision. Yeah. Um, and so, what we've tried to do is really help um, the team build out. Um, we've got a decision-making framework. We, you know, there's not a lot of original ideas in this world. Mm-hmm. We've just used the DACY format from mm-hmm. Atlassian, um, which they've very helpfully out open sourced um, <laughs> to you know to, to, to everyone. Um, so that's the f- that's the framework that we use. Mm-hmm. But then the concept around it is really just making sure people understand. Okay, I'm making a decision. I need to have like a hypothesis-led mm-hmm. approach. What am I expecting to happen here? And is this decision, there's obviously a risk lens, like am I putting customers at risk, value at risk? Is there risk of regulated, like mm. we're in a regulated environment, is there risk around that and sort of understanding all of those things. Mm. Um, and when you come to those decisions, some of those decisions are one-way doors, right? So um, when I think about, say I'm just using the theme of the Aussie merger because yep. we've just been talking about it. Um, the decision around brand was a really topical one up front it was a really easy decision to make but mm. it was a topical one lots of the aussie brokers were scared that we we're going to get rid of the aussie brand and Mm-mm. everything was going to become lendy now let's just say we did that that's a one-way door you don't take <laughs> the signs off <laughs> yeah, yeah. stores and change the brand and all that sort of stuff it's very hard to reverse mm. um, both psychologically and there's obviously really costly so if you were making a decision like that um, you would be quite methodical about it. You can have a lot of friction around it because mm. you want to canvas lots of opinions, et cetera, et cetera. And then you make the decision knowing that it's one way door. Um, reversible decisions, the, the best example there would be testing a feature. Yeah. So 
even if you're testing a feature, we have one of our highest traffic parts of our platform is what we call funnel one, which is basically you've come off the homepage or one of our major, one of our landing pages and we've got a very effective funnel based strategy, which is dynamic based on where you've come from. But mm. when customers are in the funnel, mm. we've got a high degree of those, high proportion of those will convert into a, into a signed up account. Um, and we have tens of thousands of high intent customers in those every single day. And we spend a lot of, we put a lot of media dollars behind that. And on the surface, you might go, that's a really risky place to cha- make a change. Um, but actually, it's, 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 it's really easy and I'm really comfortable with it because if you limit it to two or three or four or five percent of the traffic, mm. um, you do it in a proper way behind a feature flag, you have a hypothesis around what you want to see, you identify the metrics up front around what might change. It's really, really easy to reverse that decision if you don't see mm. what you want. You sort of watch the data and by the end of day one or two, you'll start to see for a very small portion of traffic mm. – that has it behaved how you thought and if it's behaving well great you ramp it right up over time and if it's not you can turn it off and and off you go so it's really important i think to understand between those two things um and if you then feed that into your decision making process and you can help your people make decisions faster Mm. well it's all it's like just a capacity thing right Mm. if you've got 10 backlogged decisions that you haven't made (laughs) that's taking up your mind space yes you're having discussions with other colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. If you've made nine of those decisions mm. today or tomorrow, guess what? You've got more capacity to do other things. Beautiful. I'm very glad I asked <laughs> you to dig into that because I'm loving, um, you know, I, I've, I've heard of the concept, but I love your um, articulation and connection into the Lendy business. Uh, and I'm so passionate about this topic, which is like making decisions. Because mm. uh, to your point there, it's like, not making any decisions is far worse because at least making the wrong decision, you can learn from it Mm. and you can go like, is that right or wrong? Yes, no, move forward. As long as you have a process like you have. Um, Love it. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And I, so like we touched on something right in the beginning, right? And we talked about this concept where um, around your skill, your skill and where you see yourself um, kind of, let's call it like the, your, your superpower ability to stack many skills together and go as deep, deeply as you know, as you can mm. without being the full expert. I love this. And I think this is a really powerful thing as a CEO, right? Like if a leader is an you know, incredible leader, but they don't know any of the detail, the challenge with an organization, especially one of a thousand people is like, if you don't know enough, if someone says that's going to take nine months, you're like, okay, mm. yeah. <laughs> I, I guess so. Cause I, I, I don't know. Um, where did that like learnings come from for you? Like where, where did you like, was it intuitively the right thing to do to know you know as much as you could or like how does it come about i think it, ca- it came about organically to start mm. with but i've kind of honed honed almost the craft of it over mm. time so i'm just a naturally curious person mm. um i've got far too much useless information in my <laughs> head <laughs> um and that comes from you know everything from sort of getting obsessive about certain topics um to just being really interested like as a kid i just remember um I think for my like 11th or 12th birthday, my parents got me a subscription to Wheels magazine and I used to literally read every every word from front to back and I'd know all the specs on all the cars and <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. It was just completely useless yeah, information yeah. but it just was sort of there. So that's kind of the background. Mm. And then I realised at one point um, just having conversations with people, you know, you sort of – and you've I'm sure you can relate to this as well. Like everyone has the concept of imposter syndrome. You're like you find yourself <laughs> in a room, you're having a particular conversation, yeah. you're like, wow, am I really – qualified to be having this conversation and this happens in as you're kind of going through your career so maybe sort of you know 10 or 15 years ago sort of having some of these conversations and then you have these penny drop moments and you go actually i know quite a lot on this topic Mm, (laughs) mm. and you can have a debate and you don't necessarily have to be right but Mm. you know enough about these topics to and you get conviction through those processes and so um i had a few of those those realization moments and then if i fast forward to now i've kind of realized that that's something that is really useful as a leader like if i if I think about my role as like one of the key parts of my role is to make sure we've got the right people in the organization. Mm. And one of, again, go back to the principles. One of our other principles is when we're growing our team, it must be a hell yeah. Yeah. And what that means is like, let's not have an, let's not, like, we'd rather have an empty seat than yeah. get someone that, you know, is going to kind of, yeah, that, they'll do. Mm. Um, and so if you kind of work in that world and you've got, you know, this high bar around the team, we talk about it as we, like we need to be a professional sports team. So yeah. if you think about, you know, it's, it's business, not family. So if you think about, um, and it doesn't mean you don't treat people well, by the way. Of but, course. <laughs> but if you think about, if you think about um, 
the way a sports team operates, you've always got to have A players. And if those A players are missing their shots, like in the case of basketball, mm. they're on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we think about that in the context of the team. And so you've got to get this dynamic right between as a leader, not encroaching on their area and trusting your team, but at the same time being able to test and challenge the subject matter. So mm. to your point before about the nine months, mm. um, that might be the right answer. But if you've got a really good depth of knowledge on the topic, you can maybe ask those three or four prodding questions that mm. might just make your hell yeah player yeah. <laughs> go and look at it a slightly different way and you get a different outcome. I love that. And and I you know what I love is because I'm hearing a few of these different themes that I, I, I too went about learning through the process of business and the hell yeah, hell no. I, I think I've heard if, it, if it's not a if it's not a hell yeah, it's a <laughs> hell no, but it's not quite a hell yeah. It's, well that was actually we, we we when we had the offsite, um this is one of the I'm I'm pretty anti woke. Um, yeah, yeah. But we had a few people in the room that were like, "Oh no, that's just a bit too. We can't publish that. It's a bit too PC." So I probably shouldn't. Have yeah. So for said all, that, for, but for all the punters out there, I'll I'll say it. So, yeah. so the, the quote is, "If it's not a fuck yes, it's a fuck no." <laughs> <laughs> now, something you touched on there, um, really really interesting, right? Is around this 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 role as as a CEO is to place the right people in those seats. Yeah. And so like help the, help the audience understand what is the process for you um, to find that right person, to make sure you get the hell yeah. Yeah, so firstly, the reason why it's so important is regardless of where technology is, mm. great people are force multipliers. You put a person who's call it a 10 out of 10 if you're doing a linear scale, mm next to someone who's a 7 out of 10 and you get 3x the outcome. Mm. So it's like it's, it's, it's not linear in terms, of, in terms of capability. And the faster people learn that, um, it took me, that was probably, if I've got one regret um, as a founder was not learning that early enough in the journey. Mm. We sort of, we had sound bites around that sort of probably, you know, three or four or five years into the journey in particular with Lendy. But the last four years we've unlocked so much because we've had to. So that's probably mm. the first the first way to sort of think about the second way or in terms of answering the question around um, how we go about it. Mm. um, There's two things. You've got to have a diverse pool of people coming into your world. Mm. Um, The chances when you need to fill an A player seat, the Mm. chances of that person jumping onto seek are pretty close to nil. Yes. Right. Um, They're going to be in market. They, you know, typically in a role, um, and even getting them at the moment where they're ready to move is pretty close to nil. So mm. you've got to build a talent bench. Um, and so we've tried to do that in the business. We've got, a, we've got talent communities that we've, we've created across lots of different roles where people have inquired or we've done outreach to people and they might not be right at the time. We sort of keep them across the business. We do that across the broader organisation. Mm. And then for more senior roles, the only way is just through basically building community. So... Um, you know, networking with people. Mm. If you find smart people, just getting to know them and getting to know their objectives around where they are. And, Mm. you know, again, I I can sort of point to two or three people in our core group leadership team Mm. that we met at many times in their journey. It just wasn't the right time. And then we had an opening and it happened to line up, but they'd known us for two or three years. So they've been on the journey and they're ready to jump because they sort of know the vision at that point. Um. David, I'm just going to be honest with you and the audience, I'm frothing because <laughs> I this is like super interesting to me because that concept and I keep hearing these sporting analogies that I'm loving, like the, yeah. the talent bench and then it, it's almost like a, um, you know, it's like a big business to business sales approach that you're taking for talent. It's like the realisation that they're not online and that you have to build network through a long time. Like, like that's really interesting and that is something I did not do <laughs> and I could see how that would the impact that would make. Yeah. So then you've placed an A player. Like what do you do? How do you focus on getting the best out of that person to create your force multiplied to them? I think the first thing is um, while we're pretty dogmatic around like our ways of working and our mm-hmm. principles, mm-hmm. everyone operates differently. There's all these you know different personality types. People have had different histories and respond differently to different ways of operating. So the first thing is really understanding who the individual is mm. and what's going to put them into kind of turbo mode or growth mode and 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 what's going to sort of rub them up against the or rub, rub against the wrong mm. way so it's sort of understanding that about people is really important to start with and then it's just getting into a rhythm around um, where can you be helpful as a leader so 
I do. I spend a lot of time. We've got sort of. I got. We got an executive leadership team, and then we have got a group leadership team, which mm. is not necessarily all the direct reports of the execs. Mm. Um, it's a. It's key people across the organisation that are um, either run particular PLs mm. or particular functions that are important to to the growth of the of the of the business. And I'd have at least a monthly one on one with mm. almost everyone in that group. Um, and it's not about. Um, it's not about micromanagement. My, mm-hmm. my framing to all of them is this is your time to use how you want. Mm. Um, how can I be helpful? And mm. for some of them they use it as a bounce session. For some of them they use it to help unblock things. For some of them we just go deep on particular topics mm. and it might be like product vision stuff. Mm. Um, and I, I, I get a lot of value out of it and hopefully they do as well. Love that. Uh, I saw a little smile when you said product vision. So I want to shift there. <laughs> I, want to, I want to shift there because something you touched on before is that around like um, – your want for like going deep on like the AI topic, yeah. right? And obviously it's it's very topical right now. It's like how do you think about it as an organization at your scale and like what are you looking to do that you think will change the the, the, the landscape of work with AI? Oh, such a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> how long have we got? <laughs> uh, four and a half hours now. <laughs> um, oh, look, I think so – Everyone listening would obviously be across what's happening in AI at a, mm-hmm. high, a high level and some at a mm-hmm. deep level. Um, I've been actively in business for over 20 years mm-hmm. and this is like – and I'm not certainly not the first person that says this. Mm-hmm. This is a, this has been a profound moment for not just business but the world yep. in terms of the advent. Uh, even you saw Microsoft the other day investing billions of dollars in nuclear power – Mm. to power data centers that mm. are ultimately powering foundation models like it's incredible this is a this is a this is a seismic shift in the way things will business will be done communication will happen across borders um and the way work will happen that's mm. kind of the framing that we mm. sort of start mm. with and a couple of useful mental models that i sort of use with the team on this are if you think about um a typical new product you typically have this massive, massive hype curve and mm. things get overhyped really, yep. really quickly. And then you have like a trough and then largely, you know, the good ones will land at that hype point at mm. some point in time. Um, I think what's happening with AI is for a large part of the business community, they're almost applying that model to what's happening here. Mm. Um, but actually what's happening behind the scenes is there's an exponential growth mm. in not just the foundation models but the products being built on top and the organizations that are that are sort of utilizing it mm. internally. And so there's almost like a false positive in the context of that that trough where, mm. where we should still be on this massive big hype curve. Um, I think a lot of you know a lot of people, yeah, called Chat GPT. I've seen that yeah. thing that wrote the funny poem to the tune of yeah. like my favorite Metallica song. Yeah. Like and they put it in that bucket. Whereas yeah. when you break it down to practical terms, yes, it can help you write documents faster, mm-hmm. it can be a thought partner and all that sort of stuff. Um, but and maybe just I'll kind of one of the ones that we're talking to the team about at the moment is if you think about the way product and engineering teams work, mm. every business does this differently and there's no right or wrong way but if you think about like a, a typical product and engineering team, you might have a product manager, might have a designer, you might have a tech lead, a few engineers and a QA mm. and it's a pot of five or six um, and that pot of five or six will go through a cycle where they're they start with a hypothesis. They go, here's the thing I'm going to build. Mm. You then do some designs. That takes some time. You do some user interviews. That takes some time. That You turn those into high fidelity designs. You might visualize that in something like Figma. You work through all the screens. That then moves into the tech lead comes in at the right time to work out, okay, great, what design pattern do we use and how does that fit into our architecture? And you got this anyway. Then you go through build and then you go through testing mm-hmm. and then you got user testing and it's like a three-month cycle. Yeah. Um, Fast forward to today, and this doesn't apply to every single use case. And, and again, there's a lot of caveats around this. Mm-hmm. And this is a good topic where I'm not the expert. I'm going to yeah, 80% yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's there's products like Cursor, which mm-hmm. have come out recently, mm-hmm. which are effectively powered by – you can plug in whatever large language model. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are using Claude 3.5 yep. for Cursor in particular because Claude's very good at writing code. Mm-hmm. And you have these almost what I'd call them are like product management – engineers mm. who will actually sit there with cursor and in an hour build a working web app with a front end and a back end right so you play that through in the development mm. life cycle and you can actually imagine a world where 
rather than having this team of five or six that's working on a three-month cycle, you actually have a team of two. You have like a designer and then mm. you have a product engineer mm. who are working on a two-week cycle where actually the design process is the fully working prototype. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Your high fidelity is your working version. <coughs> working yeah. version, exactly yeah. right. And look, there's steps that need to be taken mm-hmm. to do that over big production code bases mm-hmm. and, you know, there's security considerations and mm-hmm. all those sorts of things. Yes, I fully acknowledge that mm. it's not as simple as I just described. But the point being um, this is not incremental. This is step change. Mm. And that's just – that's a high-tech – or that's a high-tech example of it. Mm. But you can apply the same thing to, you know, how you deal with legal and contract mm-hmm. reviews, mm-hmm. how you deal with onboarding um, – Building out a marketing and growth strategy mm, mm. and content, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> like it's endless. <laughs> it's it's wild, and you're getting me juiced up. <laughs> you're getting me juiced up here because uh, this is one of those topics that I've spent way too many hours consuming information. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, there's different people that have these mentalities. Some of them say, "Yeah, we've went through this for the the printing press," or "Yeah, we went through this with uh, dot com or the um, the industrial revolution." I don't think that's the same. Like it doesn't feel no. the same in any way. You know, you just touched on there around the product designer using um, Cursor. Like I was with Fred Shibester a couple of weeks ago and he said um, in their uh, hackathons, mm. the the product um, people are now beating the, um, engineers. the d- engineers. Why? Yeah. Because actually they know from the contextual piece from the actual customer and yeah. so they know they're <clears throat> able to like describe it and then they don't have to write the code and it's coming back. It's fundamentally shifting like – Play like a macro just for me, just for like let's have a bit of <laughs> have a bit of fun. Like it's five years from today. Like h- how do you think that this is going to change the world? Like do you think it's um, are we all okay? Do we all have jobs? Like like what's your what's your thinking on it? Yeah, look at a principle level. Um, I'm in the camp that says, and whether you're talking five years, ten mm. years, whatever, um, I'm in the camp that says that productivity will find a home. Like mm. efficient mar- market theory. The, the difference in this situation is just the speed of change. Yeah. Um, and so what we're seeing in the background, I think will start to enable organizations to be spun up. And you hear, you, mm. you know, you hear, there's actually, um, I don't, have you heard of um, Balaji Srinivasan? No. Um, he's a, oh, I don't even know how you describe him, call him an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's actually just started this, it's like a, it's like a startup island thing just off Singapore. <laughs> um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a whole world around like these kind of digital nomads mm. that are sort yeah. of, you know, some of them run, like some of them are indie hackers and they run these little products. Yes. Um, and, you know, they're built in public and all that sort mm. of stuff. Um, that world enabled by AI, mm. like there, and there are a lot of people talking about this, there's going to be the first billion dollar company that's got two employees yeah. as an example. <laughs> someone will build a product, they'll have so much leverage yeah. from these tools and you'll have someone who's genuinely mm. a 10x human, let alone a 10x engineer, yes. et cetera, doing this. But those things weren't possible a decade ago. Mm. And so technologies like this are unlocking that stuff and that's just going to drive faster change to whatever that future state is. And mm. so... I think we'll have this disruptive period. Um, it won't be like the pandemic can happen in a month. It'll mm-hmm. happen over time. Yep. But I think the landing point is just, you know, people need purpose mm. and purpose will find opportunities. There'll be new jobs. Mm. Um, it's like there's definitely not a dystopian view on this one from mm. my perspective. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> We have a slight cross, like a slight delineation in our thinking, but we'll have to see how it plays out. My, my, what's, my, what's your thinking? My challenge is this, right? <clears throat> and 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 I'm similar to you, as I say, like nothing that comes out of my mouth is unique. It's more just like many different pieces, and then I find like what's the part yeah. that I think that resonates with me. I think the the gap in time creates like a void. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're, we're on, you know, not an exponential, but let's say a soon exponential curve. Microsoft's spending $5 billion a year to acquire and build out these things. This thing is just getting more and more crazy, right? Uh, and as the efficiencies start to make their way into a business, like the reality of a boardroom of a public listed company, it's brutal game there. Like they're not like, oh, but we feel bad because of X. It's like, oh, how do we save 30%? Oh, we mm. cut all of these. And I think that the, how quickly that happens, the void that's created in like the job market, I, I'm like, what does that one to two years look like when there's mm. like a really big gap 
And yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Like, I don't know dystopian. Like, I mean, am I in Mad Max? Am I shooting rockets from a <laughs> in a sand, from a sandcastle? Probably not. But like, I know, look, I think we're, I think we're aligned on that. Mm. I think I think I probably just didn't articulate I, yeah. t- articulate as well as you did there. Like, that's probably the challenge mm. that I think we're gonna need to deal with. Is mm. it will happen all of a sudden and all at once? Yes. Um, but I think where we get to on the other side of that is like, I'm I'm not a subscriber to UBI or any yeah. of those concepts because no. I just don't think like if you look at Things like socialism and communism, like those, like fundamentally just haven't worked, Mm. right? So we're in the same corner of the internet, Dave. I like it. (laughs) We're in the same, we're in the same content spiral. No, that's that's, that's good. And and I think, you know, as I hear you talk about what's what's exciting to me, and one of the things I actually think is a, let's call it an opportunity to the world, um, is the reality is that the um, corporate and public listed entities, who aren't at the forefront creating the AI technology, I think they're actually going to help that time span because they're so risk mm. adverse. You know, so I've already seen many organisations in Australia who are like, we'll wait to see AI play out. Like we'll put it maybe in this little corner yeah. to get there. But really for the listeners, like that's the opportunity. Like the opportunity lies today for like going and, and seeing how you can utilise it um, because, you, yeah, you can actually go against a pretty big business with very small resources if you can. Oh, look, I completely agree. I mean, we've seen firsthand, we, like our business is a partnering business. We've mm. got lots of um, businesses we work with in, 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 in Australia across the banks and property space mm. and all that sort of stuff. And the amount of time, like this is a topic I spend a lot of time talking mm. to people about and there are businesses out there that are killing any of the productivity they'll get from this just through they're trying to create these ethical AI frameworks around topics that they don't understand and ultimately mm. where you land when you push a product through there is the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so for anyone who's thinking about like there's going to be this huge big and I don't think it's going to be 10%, I think it's going to be more like the 80 mm. or 90% mm. of incumbent businesses that just aren't going to be able to move fast yeah. enough. There's not going to be someone that's empowered to make that mm. decision or take that risk and that's a that's a massive opportunity. I reckon there'll be <clears throat> it's going to be a great consolidation. The, yeah. the environment I think happens and how it plays out it's a, it's a, it, it, it like supercharges the winner takes all environment. Mm. You know what I mean? Like even when as you think about things like ChatGPT, like a lot of people are building their businesses on top of the, like the, the business itself yeah. and like these businesses are just like expanding to just yeah. like <laughs> atrocious let, let me shift for a second um how does lendy think about how do you think about marketing like what, what what's your like how how's it shifted mm. over the years to come because obviously that would have been a big part of how you were able to gain traction i'd love to kind of get learnings insights for audience around your your, your approach to marketing yeah it's a it's another one that we've honed over time mm. um today we call it product-led growth and there's, you know, plenty of people that talk about product mm-hmm. growth and how to think about that. Um, on day one, it was actually how do we compete against people who have far bigger budgets than us? Yeah. <laughs> and so when we started the bit, let me is it, sure. yeah, t- tell me that because I'm curious. How do you compete? And then we'll get to the product like growth. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, when we started, we had like I think my first marketing budget was like five thousand dollars, right? Love so we that. started <laughs> when we <laughs> we when we started the business, we just we had to find a way to acquire customers, mm. and we there was no way at the time, you know, cost per click in the home loans category <laughs> has always been incredibly high mm. in the high intent categories or you know, high intent keywords was at the at, in the early stage like. 10 20 bucks right Mm. um you just can't you can't make those work as an early stage business so we had to be scrappy and find ways um to find customers in in different ways where we weren't competing against Mm. people that had big budgets the the advantage we knew we had up front though was everyone else was just using marketing agencies so i talk about outsourcing thinking before Mm. um and i still think most big businesses do this today they outsource their growth to Mm. a marketing agency and so we set up front, we need to have our advantage is we're going to be obsessive about every dollar that, go, that, that goes out and we need to, every dollar that goes out has to be X dollars back in. Yeah, right. That's super, super interesting. Just give us one second. You, you're listening to the podcast and I'm here to tell you to follow it. Come on, let's get stuck back in. He's an interesting dude, eh? Um, but we want to control it end to end. We're not going to sort of outsource the mm. thinking and strategy. So we landed on this approach up front, which again, we didn't call it product the growth at the time. But probably the most successful approach was um, this concept of free property report. So finding customers who were in the home loan space, mm. they weren't necessarily saying, hey, I want to refinance, I want to buy a house, but they were doing something in that world. Mm. So we launched this product called free property report, which was really just at the time, the first version of it 
was a landing page into a Google sheet and we had someone in our <laughs> Philippines team emailing them the property report. Yes. <laughs> um, and we ended up being one of the first uh, API customers for CoreLogic yeah. in the end. So we, we built that into a proper funnel that was automated and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But what that allowed us to do was give a customer real value. Mm. We could acquire them at, again at the time. This is when um, before Meta Days, this is when Facebook, you, you could, like we were acquiring leads for like 80 cents a dollar mm. on Facebook. Mm. Um, in the early days, that was just a gold mine in the early <laughs> stage because um, no one else was advertising yeah, back yeah. in 2013. And um, what, like the lifetime value of a customer to your dollar acquisition <laughs> is just gorgeous. Yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, those like like anything that these these pools get found out over time. Yeah. Um, but what it allowed us to do was bring a customer in low intent, and mm. we could then have a conversation with them at the time about, okay, great, you're looking for what's you know what's one Smith Street worth. Are you looking because you're looking to buy? Are you looking, is it your house, et cetera, et cetera? And you're allowed to, it allows you to start a conversation and put that customer on mm. a journey. And the conversion rate wasn't very, very high. But when you look at it on terms of cost of acquisition, we were acquiring customers for cheaper than we could buy clicks for on the high intent mm. campaigns mm. on Google. So that strategy we've, we've amplified now until we've got hundreds and hundreds of different funnels. And mm. we call it product led growth, which is all about build products for your customers that help them in their everyday life but mm. obviously focused around finance and property has mm. been always the focus and probably the best example of that now is the Aussie app. So um, we've embedded this in lots and lots of points of the Aussie experience mm. um, but customers can now claim their property, they can see what it's worth, they can track that value over time. Very soon they'll be able to track their live equity so as their loans are getting paid down, the property's going up, they can see that play out over time. They can see their credit score and how that changes over time. Mm. They can, they've can they got live access to their broker's calendar. So they can book an appointment in the broker's diary. They can continue their application, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we do with all of that is we get this rich treasure mm-hmm. trove of signals from the customer around what they're doing and when they're in market. And so we can work out when to insert ourselves back in their life, mm-hmm. whether that's a call or an SMS or a push notification or an email or – um, the customer, like we, we become the next logical place that they mm. go for their transaction. And that's allowed us over time to, if I sort of go back up to the thousand foot view and I look at all the money we spend on marketing and all the outcomes we get for that, mm. Google's only gone in one direction, Meta's only gone in one direction, mm. but our weighted average cost of acquisitions gone, continue to compound down because mm. we've built this really great ecosystem. We now got four and a half million customers on the platform um, and we're growing that by about six hundred thousand a year. So wow, it's um <laughs> wow. I love that. Yeah. But it's a big investment, <laughs> yeah, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You actually think about your product and your f- mm-hmm. feature roadmap yeah. as a driver of growth, as totally. opposed to just yes, you have to couple that with spending yep. more money on marketing, of course. Yeah, but um, they go hand in hand. It's interesting. So, and, and as, as I hear that, what I want to do for the audience is also help them contextualize because like, oh, I'm not in the home loans business is like what I hear, I'll play back to you, tell me if I'm right or wrong, is it, it's like you're kind of going upstream into the decision-making mm. process. So th- when I think about that Aussie app, mm. you're not making money from them uploading their property. You're not making money from them thinking about their valuation, but you're trying to be earlier on in the decision-making process to be like, where can I be here? And through this, we're building brand and we're being together. <laughs> and then the, the longer we are together, mm. then I'll be more likely to be the logical decision-making point. Does yeah, that- if you take it almost to like um, university mm. marketing 101, yes. um, it's basically thinking about the marketing funnel as like awareness, consideration, yep. conversion. And you're building products that exist across each yes. of those layers. Yes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a there's a quote from a guy called um, Alex Hormozzi. I'm going to fully butcher the quote. Have you heard much? Have you seen much? I've of come Alex? across Alex. Yeah, he's, Alex and Layla. Yeah. He's a he's a bit of a beast. I, I, I quite <laughs> like him. And recently, I had a friend who who, who went to his um, like mastermind in, in the US. He said he loved it. And he said yeah. to me like the big challenge he had from um, Hormozzi was this idea of like do more and be better. And the idea was like, you know, a lot of businesses look for, you know, there's, they do, they're doing something well, it's getting, it's generating revenues, product market fit. And they're like, great. Okay. Now I'll do the next thing. And then, and then like, and they've never like, rather than just focusing on this, like do more of the things that works and just do it better. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to play that to you and go like, how do you think about that in your organization? That type of thinking. Yeah. So the first element of that is really about optimization. Mm. And if you take it up one layer, it's about prioritization around what you do. So mm. if you think about 
one of the things, one of the sayings I heard recently on a podcast, again, no, no original ideas, <laughs> um, was the main thing is always keeping the main thing the main thing, mm. <laughs> which is like businesses can often go off and veer in different courses. Mm. Um, so you almost got to start with like what is that thing that you're going after as an organisation and within that as you release things and I'll, I'll give you like a great, a great example. So we've spent the last um, decade building what we think is the best digital home loan platform in the market not just for customers but for brokers as well and when we rolled out to Aussie um, there were things about the Aussie process customers segments transaction types that the platform wasn't the best at and mm. so we had to spend this period of time iterating and changing etc 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 so we could kind of get the right level of efficiency out of um, those you know whatever that particular thing was um, we made sure as an organization that that was the main thing. Mm. Everyone understood exactly where that was. And we're still doing lots of those activities today. There's, there's um, you know, if you talk about them in the context of objectives, mm. so like what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to take hours out of the broker's day or minutes mm. out of the broker's day. You then sort of can work out, you know, features or initiatives that sort mm. of fit within those objectives. But um, we will get to a point where we get to diminishing returns around that. Mm. Um, we're not there today, but that then kind of ladders back up to the strategy. And so I talked before about our, like where we're kind of going next, which is bringing um, the property search and mm. ownership experience together with finance. Mm. Um, we've got a high level of conviction that that's where we go next as an organisation. Mm. And what we need to straddle is how do we – do that at the same time as making sure we're, we're continuing to optimize this piece. And mm. the way we sort of think about that at a, like a framework level mm. is very, very like this is a crude way to think about our business, but we've got capacity and we've got mm. to fill that capacity with customers. Mm. And so the way we sort of think about that is like as long as we can continue creating capacity through efficiency on the broker side, mm. actually what we're doing in the property space is actually bringing more customers into our world. Mm. And so we, we talked to to the business, we got a lot of metrics that we measure at the leadership level that sort of talks to that, and I think that's how you sort of get the congruence between what's the big thing on the hill you're going after, and mm -hmm. how do you make sure people stay focused along the way. Epic, I love it. I, I, I've got two more questions for you. The first one is, um, you know, a lot of the times when we have these conversations, uh, I've realised um, it's like questions and it's like historical, and we're talking yeah. about things, and then I'm trying to put people in their mindset of like where they were at that moment. But I'm fascinated about the today. So, yeah. like, run me through like a, an existing challenge that you have, and then like, what's your process to actually go and solve for that? Yeah, good question. <laughs> have I stumped you? Uh, <laughs> no, you haven't stumped me. You haven't stumped me. I'm just trying to think um, which is the best example to give you. Um, I'll because we've been talking about marketing and growth. Mm -hmm. I'll give you. I'll give you one of those ones. Awesome. So um, we. When we brought the Lendy and Aussie business together, we had a you know a phase where we bring the business together, a phase where we bring the brokers and customers onto the platform, mm. and then there's been like an embedding phase. Mm. And now the embedding phase is done. Mm. A big part of our growth is going back to the customer side, bringing more customers into our world. Um, to do that, we're now doing that over a much bigger budget. Mm. And the problem we needed to solve was how do we go from X to Y in terms of spend where the gap was not an extra 10 or 20 or 100 grand a month. It was sometimes in the millions. <laughs> um, how do we do that in a way that doesn't completely blow out our cost of acquisition? Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that is a – and maybe just playing through, you know, how we sort of tried to solve that. Like we've got a team that owns growth. This is a big enough business problem that it actually needs lots and lots of – kind of heads in trying mm, to solve mm. the problem. Because when you, when you when we sort of played it out in our business, we've got to not only build the right media plan, buy the right media, do it in the right way, have the right testing framework, but also as those customers come into our world, we've got to make sure that the Aussie brokers who haven't been used to getting lots and lots of new customers through from centralised marketing, we've mm. got to make sure that those conversations are held in the right way, mm, mm. they convert, <laughs> etc. Because the revenue doesn't happen, as you said before, it's yeah. not when customers are creating an account, yeah. that's, that's not the revenue point. Yeah. The revenue point is when they settle their home loan. Mm. Um, so we needed to build a fully integrated plan around that. And going back to the point around um, decision making, 
um, and one way doors and, and all that and testing frameworks. We we took a pretty like we took a um, hopefully what would be an obvious approach to mm. doing it all. So we started with a test market. So um, we we started a test in South Australia. We had really good. It's a it's a good test market because we only have. 20 or 30 stores there, mm. we've got above average market share. So mm. we know that customers like us in that market. And we chunked out a particular increment in budget mm. and a shift in our media mix mm. um, across TV, radio, out of home, digital, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we set up a bunch of lead indicators, a bunch of lag indicators, and it's just lots of eyes on glass. Mm. <laughs> um, and so we ran that in South Australia for six or eight weeks. And as that unlocked and we got learnings from what was working what wasn't and as that unlocked both the lead and lag indicators mm. we then moved that to queensland mm. and that was a couple mm. of weeks ago um and we're seeing different things play out in queensland and different challenges and different mm. things but the teams it's a full court press from the leadership team to the growth team to our distribution team who own the brokers to our customer team who kind of own parts of the funnel where the customers aren't yet handed over to a broker um but it's taken everyone understanding the end-to-end -end problem mm. And all being signed up to the objective where, which is we need to be able to spend a dollar and return Y dollars. Yes. <laughs> and everyone knows what that is and yes. they know their part to play in that problem. It, it, it's really interesting that like there's a final piece of what you just said there, which I think is so critical for business and, and, and something that's so easily missed is like everybody in the team, everybody in the organization, they have to understand And when you ask the question like, what are we, who are we about? Like, what is our objective? Yeah. They can't answer that. <laughs> we're, we're fundamentally in trouble and it yeah. seems really obvious but it's so common you know yeah. like it's something you touched on from like the leadership point of view when we're yeah. talking about the you know um having you know, all the leaders leaders aligned like having everybody know exactly what success and failure is or isn't i see it too frequently like you cannot answer the question like what does success look like we, we start with a problem yeah i think a lot of people start activities so to speak mm. with the answer mm. And it's the answer to their own question as opposed to a problem statement or, or, or an opportunity statement. Mm. And you then start, you know, whether that's building a feature or changing a process or whatever, is you're doing it without any, like how do you then, mm. um, how do you then measure success? How do you set up a framework around what's working, what's not? Um, if you bring it back to what's the problem we're trying to solve and why and what's a, I also think that a lot of people get caught up in, it, it's, it's partly in the category of outsourcing decisions, but... Mm. Um, you know, they start with almost, okay, great, we've got to do some testing at the early stage, which might be customer testing, um, without starting with a hypothesis. Yeah, I'm, like yeah. I'm a really big believer in people sort of saying, here's a problem space. Yeah. Here's what I think the answer is based on my intuition. Actually coming back to Ray Dalio, I think one of the things he does really well in his principles mm -hmm. is he talks about surrounding yourself with people that have a high, they've, they've proven themselves to have a high probability of, um, success in their decision making yes. so you don't really know why they're just, yeah, they're, yeah yeah they're, yeah, yeah. They're, and, and i think if you've got that in your team mm. people should have intuition or a gut feel around what i think the answer is that doesn't mean you don't go and do customer testing mm. you don't build a testing framework you don't do all of those things yep. that, that, are, that are good hygiene but you've really got to start got to put a stake in the ground at the start and say here's what i think is going to happen love that all right last question for you dave um and it, it's we, we touched on it right in the beginning but it's like that the we don't often have that moment to reflect, but you, you've been on this journey for a long time. I'm sure there's many years ahead. Like mm. when you sit back now and reflect on, what would you say you're most proud of to this day? I think um, when you set out to go after like a big lofty goal, um, that big lofty goal is, and in particular in the context of a founder led organization, it starts in one person's head or two people's head or three people's head. Um, and, you know, sometimes you hit that objective and sometimes you don't, mm. um, and many, many, many don't. I think the thing that's I'm most proud of is when I see that vision in our people and success for me is seeing someone in the team, doesn't matter who they are, where they are in the organization, selling our vision to someone else. Mm. Um, cause that says that you've got people not just on the journey as passengers, but on the journey and driving things forward in your mm. way. And that's like... I think in any for any entrepreneur, like your job is to be infectious. Your job is to take an idea and a concept, come up with a solution for that thing and build a community of people that are going after solving that problem. And I think that's success. So that would be what I'm most proud of if, when I sort of see that in the business. 
I said last question, but I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> last, last question. You said the word vision there and it sparked my interest. When you started this business, when you co-founded it, did you see this scale in your in your mind? Obviously, not every permutation and detail, but did you see was this the was this the the grand vision to be at the play, like playing the level you're playing at today? Vision scale, yes. How we got there, like absolutely not. <laughs> like we've had so many twists and turns, yeah. and like if you plotted that out on a map and said to someone up front, "This is what you're going to be doing for the next <laughs> decade of your life," you just wouldn't do it. <laughs> and and sometimes you sort of you, you make those twists and turns because either you've got to do it from a capital perspective, mm. you got to do it from a strategy perspective or a market perspective, mm. whatever that, whatever that is. Um, but if you if you if you look at the two points mm. in time, like we definitely we always set up front to people we wanted to get to five percent market share. Mm. Um, we're at six, um, and we've got lofty ambitions to more than double that over the next few years. Um, it's going to be hard because <laughs> um, we need to bring a lot of customers into our world and we need to change behaviour on the customer side. Mm. Seventy four odd percent of customers go to a broker, mm. and by definition, most of that's offline. Mm. And we've got offline channels. We're building obviously an omni channel experience, mm. but. Um, for us to be ubiquitous, we've got to insert ourselves into every part of the property journey for customers and and well ahead of that. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a big goal ahead of us, <laughs> um, but it's going to be fun, I think. Mate, that's, so it's like that, for me, like if I'm putting myself in the person, they've got the headphones on, they're listening right now and you have that like start of your journey or in your year two or year three and you have this, you have this big grand vision and then to have yourself here like, you know, 10-ish years later and you're, you're like it's, very, very impressive. Yeah, it right. probably probably took twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always. It's it's double as hard and, and twice as long to get there. Yeah. Uh, but it looks to be so far worth it. Dave, what an absolute pleasure, mate. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been great.